All right, so today we're going to be talking about heaps in C++. Heaps in the standard library are something called a priority queue. So it is std priority queue in the standard library. And we are actually going to not only discuss it conceptually, we're going to code one from scratch. So there's kind of two different ways you can think of a heap. Uh, the first way is you can think of it as literally like a queue. If you guys remember queues from a couple weeks ago, uh, basically you've got people kind of like waiting in line, right? Like they're at a bank teller or something like that. And what makes a priority queue different is that some people might uh, be like a VIP, right? So when Kearney rolls into the bank, Kearney doesn't wait in the consumer line, uh-uh, get bumped to the front because Kearney owns his own business. So I get to go to the merchant line and I get to come up to the front here and uh, it's my chains or something like that. And uh, I get priority over the proletariat. Or you can think of it as like the, the club, right? You got your VIPs at the club, you know, you got the bouncer. Bouncer's got like the, the velvet rope there. And then, uh, you know, the, maybe these people here are sorted by um, income, right? So people that make 100,000 a year get let in before people who make 50K a year, who get let in before people who make 40K a year. And then Yeezy rolls up in his Roblox outfit like this. And they're like, sorry, yay, you got to stay at the back of the line because you made negative $4 billion this year, right? And then your programmer comes up. He's like, I want into the club. And the programmer makes solid 250 a year. And so he gets to cut in line and go in first. So, yeah, that's that's the one I was thinking of. Tu es un bourgeois. Right. That's what I was thinking of there. So uh, basically, if you have a priority queue where you have people sorted uh, by income, then when somebody rolls in with more in income than the other people, they get let in first and the other people have to wait outside in the cold in Toronto. Uh, true story. I was going to go to uh, a, a bar called uh, uh, Grace, um, Grace O'Malley's in uh, in toronto uh because it was saint patrick's day and grace o'malley is one of my personal heroes she was a pirate queen of ireland and uh i went there and there's this long line i'm like no nah, i'm not waiting in line and yeah you know, I, I left <laughs> i didn't i didn't try bribing anybody i just like they had a but they had a separate line for vips right so like if i wanted to drop you know i don't know five hundred dollars or something i could have you know gone right in but uh, i didn't uh, i didn't actually care that much to be able to have a Guinness on St. Patrick's Day. Okay, so conceptually, does this kind of make sense to you guys? Like people are kind of like waiting in line and if somebody gets priority over somebody else, they like get a cut, okay? Another way you can think of it is as a tree. And so if we're gonna do a, uh, you can either do a min heap or a max heap. Let's do a min heap, I guess, for today because that's what we talked about last time. So uh, these numbers here could be like the seconds that like, um, you know, an action is going to take place in the future. So maybe the current time is like seven seconds into the game. And we say, okay, uh, in at time 10, you know, have a grenade go off. If you guys remember our lecture from last time, you can implement a almost basically a multi-threading system this way. We're going to have future actions take place using functors. So the rule for a heap the rule for a heap, the heap invariant, the heap rule, let's say, is that uh, for a min heap, you also have max heaps that work exactly the opposite, is that uh, everyone is smaller than that. Everyone is smaller than their children. So let me draw a heap for you here. This looks like a binary search tree, but it's not. Um, if you look at this as a binary search tree, you're going to be very confused because the numbers aren't sorted at all, right? And in fact, on a heap, it's not sorted. It's kind of sorted, but it's not really sorted. The, uh, the binary search tree, a BST is kind of like sorted left to right. You know what I mean? Like everybody to the left is smaller, everybody to the right is bigger, 
for a heap, it's sort of sorted vertically, sort of. But if you look at this, there's like no particular order to the kids, right? Because they're not, there's no sorting left to right. All that matters is up and down. And so for a min heap, all of the kids are smaller than their children, which means that this guy is the minimum value of the entire tree. So you just did a competency exam where you had to write a minimum function for ABSD. The minimum function for a heap is quite easy. You just return root points to data. 10. There you go. Okay. And, uh, and then you might be like, well, what if you want to know if, you know, 51 is in the tree somewhere? The answer is you, you can't. Um, a heap only supports a few different options. It supports inserting, deleting, uh, telling you what the top value is and the size. That's it. There's, there's no ability to search it, um, really at all. You pop everything off, I guess, if you want, and then put it back, put it back in, but that's kind of, kind of annoying. So, uh, so one of the nice things about a heap is that every heap is full and complete as can be. And so we can actually use a array to hold a heap because there's no gaps in it. If you remember when we talked about the array representation of a tree, uh, handling the gaps can be a little bit annoying. It's not the end of the world. But what can be really bad with the array representation of a tree is if the tree is unbalanced. And with a heap, it is always guaranteed to be full and complete. There's no gaps anywhere within it. And so if we were to insert a new person into the tree, let's say we're going to insert the number 200, uh, they just go into the next available spot, which would be right here. So you just put a 200 here and be done. Okay. And then if we were to insert, let's say 300, it would come in here. And if we were to insert 10, uh, we already have a 10. Or an insert uh, 11, it would go here. Now we've got a problem though. So what is the problem? Like these guys are fine. Like 200 is bigger than 100. And so it, it preserves the heap invariant, the heap property. Uh, but this guy, hmm, this guy's a problem. The problem child, quite literally, because he's the child of 51, right? So it's a problem child. So we got we to gotta fix this. So... Uh, anytime we violate the heap invariant when we insert, what we have to do is fix it, okay? And we fix it by switching the value of the child with the value of the parent. And then the heap property is preserved between these two people. But now we got, well, we got another problem. So which, which, uh, which heap invariant are we violating now? Where do we have somebody who is smaller than their parent. Yeah, very good. So this guy, well, he, that's the same problem, child. He just kind of like moved towards the front of the line, like, you know, Kanye a year ago. <laughs> Not now. Um, <laughs> and so we swap again, right? Cupid, yay. That was such an amazing episode. When Cartman is like, whoa, yay, you got to, you got to tone it down a little bit. Like, you know, you've taken things a little bit too far. Okay, so uh, how about now? Are, have we satisfied the heap property now? We have. Yeah. So basically, this is called bubbling up. So you can think of the, uh, if we insert something, it, it can basically bubble all the way up to the top. And so we either stop when we hit the root, or we stop once we check the... Uh, the comparison with our parent and we're like, all right, cool. We're good. So, uh, this is a order login operation because heaps are guaranteed to be balanced. And so the most times we would bubble up is log in, right? So insert also known as push is order login. Cause if at most we only have to go up one per level, right? We don't have to look at any of these guys. We don't have to look at any of these guys. We only have to do the comparisons with the people directly above us. So insert in heap works from left to right. Uh, uh There's no left or right in heaps. Left or right doesn't matter. We go up or down, right? So uh, we, if we insert here, we bubble up, we bubble up, we bubble up until we stop. We never look at any of the other subtrees when we're going up. Okay. So uh, let's do another, another insert just to make this uh, clear what's going on. So let's insert uh, 500. Have we violated the heap invariant or preserved 
the heap invariant. 500 is bigger than 50. You like heaps? I like heaps too. They're pretty cool. Yeah, so this is, act we're actually done. Okay, so that wasn't very interesting. Um, ah, I'm running out of room here. Um, let me just make a little tiny little 30, okay, or something like that there. Okay, right, so let's make a bigger one here. So let's insert uh, five. Okay, so what do I need to do? I have violated the heap property, right? I've now got somebody smaller than the parent. So how do, what do I do? Bubble it up, that's exactly right. So get rid of the two there, put a two in here. And now, now what? Are we good or do we have to bubble up again? Got to bubble up again, bubba. Yep, bubba. Bubba, all right. Uh, I click? Nope. Microsoft OneNote is being OneNote. <sighs> Quit and reboot. I don't know why this bug has been around for years and just for whatever reason, like it just doesn't want you to be able to do things. So five here and 25 here. Oh no, no it was 20, right? Now are we done or do we have to bubble up again? Bubba Gaina. We got uh, uh, half of them. Bub again, bub again, shrimp company. Now are we good, or do we bubble up again? Again? <laughs> Who are we going to swap with now? Yeah, we're good now, right? Because the the rule is preserved. Every if you look at any node on the tree, it is bigger than the person above it, and it is smaller than the people below it. And so you can think of heaps organized, uh, you know, up and down. Let me write heap a little bit better here. You can think of heaps as sort of being organized up and down, whereas BSDs are organized left to right. But you can't find any particular element in here because all you can do is push and pop. And so when you pop, when you delete, the only thing that ever gets deleted is root. Okay. So bubble into the null and embrace the void. Um, okay, so if we're gonna pop, so do you guys understand push now? Push is like pretty pretty fun, pretty easy, I think. You know, you just insert something in the next slot and then you bubble up if you gotta bubble up. Okay. Uh, so popping takes a little bit more effort, but it's still conceptually not too bad. So what you do when you pop is five is gonna be deleted. But now we got a problem, right? We got a problem because we need something here. And so does it bubble up on its own when we push? No, you gotta write that code, right? I mean, if you if you use the priority queue, stood priority queue, yeah, it bubbles up for you. It does it for you. We're actually gonna write the data structure ourselves today. So for pop though, what we do, because we never wanna have any holes in our tree is we take that last element there, which I think was 25 before, and we put it on the root. Okay, you see this? There's now never any gaps anywhere within the tree. You just switch the root and the leaf, the very last leaf, and then we got to bubble down now because we have we have most definitely violated the heat property because we took somebody from the very bottom level and uh, put it at the top. So it's definitely going to violate the heat property. So there's a question though. Do we move it down to the left or do we move it down to the right? Which one of these is smaller, 10 or 11? Because remember, for a min heap, the root node has to be the smallest in the entire tree because everybody has to be smaller than their children. So we got to put 10 up there, right? So we have to look at two options. And this is where there's a little bit of trickiness. This guy is the smaller one. And so we swap them down like this. All right. And are we good now? Or have we still violated the heap? property. I mean, look, I mean, 25 is smaller than 1,000, right? Are we good? Or do you have to bubble down again? Bubba down. That's right. Because we are bigger than 20. We're doing a min heap. Smallest things bubble to the top. So we switch out. We swap the 20 and the 25. How about now? We got a 25 here. We got a 30 here. 
Are we good? Are we happy? Make sure you don't like go out of bounds, right? Because uh, uh, you know, if you have an off by one error or something, like you could seg faults or something, right? There's no guarantee you got two kids. You might have one kid, you might have zero kids, and you might have, you know, one, two, or zero. Right? You have three options. Okay, so yeah, so the so we bubble down, and now um, we're good. The heap invariance preserved. That's it. That's all of the operations on a heap. I mean, there's size, you know, return how big it is, and uh, top, or, you know, return the top value. But that's it. That's all there is to heaps. And what's really amazing about this is if you think about it, if you insert a bunch of numbers into a heap and then pop them all off. So if you, like, push a thousand numbers in and pop the thousand numbers, they come out sorted. Right? Because every time you pop, you get the smallest value. Right? And so... If you want to write your own sort algorithm, uh, you can just use a heap to do so. So, uh, .cc. so let's use, let's say, the uh, Q header. So let's say a priority Q of ints. And PQ is equal to, yeah, let's just do this. Uh, while true and max equals read. So we're just going to read uh, enter a number to insert the priority queue. And then if they type in zero, zero to quit. So if they type in a zero, we quit. Otherwise, we say pq.push. So we're going to build a priority queue, and uh, right now we're using a heap. We're not writing the heap just yet, but I just kind of want to show you something cool. So we're going to do that, and then we can say while pq.size, in other words, while pq.size is greater than zero, but this is C++. So we can just do that. So while there are stuff remaining in the priority queue, see out pq.top. Remember the operations on a heap, the operations on a priority queue are push, pop, top, and size. And that's really about it. Okay. And so we got to push here. We got to pop. Eh, not, we're about to do a pop. We got size, we got top, and then we do pq.pop here. And that's an entire sorting algorithm that we just wrote from scratch. Q plus plus, main.cc. If we type in 50 and 20 and 10 and 90 and 100 and zero, then it sorts, because by default, the priority queue is a max heap, right? Then it sorts it greatest to smallest. Now, if you want to know something kind of mind blowing about this, this is a provably optimal sort. So this, this algorithm cannot be beaten in terms of theoretical performance. In real life performance, yeah, there's implementation differences. But in terms of like, it's a big O in log n sort, which is the fastest running time you can have for a sort algorithm on random data. Now, these are ints, and so um, you, you can, you know, say it's, you know, it's not random data because it's constrained to 4 billion possibilities. But that aside, yeah, this is a, um, this is a, uh, provably optimal sort. You cannot write an algorithm faster than this. And this is pretty, this is a pretty easy sorting algorithm. Like if you, if you just like, you're, you know, you're applying for a job and they're like, write a sorting algorithm. I'm like, all right, I'm going to push numbers into a heap and then pop them off. And they're sorted. They come out sorted. I don't know. I mean, I think it's cool. Do you guys think it's cool? It's like, it's a lot easier to write than Pretty much anything, you know, heap sort, push it into the heap, pop it off the heap. There you go. The numbers are, they're sorted. Two lines of code or something, you know. So, you know, just push a bunch of numbers in, pop them off. You're done. That's sort. Okay, cool. That's an optimal, you know, you can't, you can't do faster than that, you know. So, 
or you can call it the sort method. Yeah, but like, you know, usually a job, you know, if you're doing a job interview and they're like, sort this data, you're, and you're like, I call sort. They're like, very funny, now write your own sort, you know? And so I would probably do it this way, you know? Like speed running, you know, if you're, if you're gonna speed run a sort, you know, writing your own sort. This is a, uh, sounds a bit like vector, but kind of hard right now. Um, it's not, it, well, actually, this is actually held in a vector. Uh, true story. So a priority queue is actually a vector that has push and pop and pop and size implemented on it. The back, the back of it is actually just a vector. And we're actually going to write it ourselves now. So, um, I'll just put this into the code graveyard for you guys. You can admire it later. The code graveyard. Take a look at this at your leisure later on. But we're going to write a uh, we're going to write a heap class. Okay. So uh, we're going to do class heap, and we'll just yeah we'll template it. Why not template? And we are going to have a vector of type T named vec. And in the public section, we're going to have a heap constructor that does absolutely nothing. Let's your stuff. Let's go to zero. Uh, of course. Uh, the code you posted earlier in public. Yeah. In, in the uh, 12 o'clock section, we did it using no classes, just using literally a vector. Uh, for this class, because you are the 230 class, you guys get to do it using proper uh, class um, techniques and things like that. Mick Riley, were you laughing about that? I think he's uh, unmuted. Okay. All right. You're muted now. All right. Cool. Uh, yeah, you're unmuted. So, uh, so what functions do we need? We need push, pop, top, and size, right? So void push, and we're going to take a const. The reference new data pop is going to re yeah. we're going to we're going to mimic the uh, we're going to mimic the standard library so this is like insert this one's like delete um, top is going to return a t And so here's our first actual function implementation. So we are going to return the first element of the vector. Now, um, what if the vector is empty? What's going to happen? Die, die, die. Right. Um, actually, this will handle it for us. Because the vector dot at does bounce checking, and so uh, it'll bounce check. And if we try accessing element zero when element zero doesn't exist, it'll just kill our program. Yay! So I think this is actually fine. Uh, so the vector is actually going to hold. The vector here is actually going to hold all the data. Okay, and it's going to hold it in the array representation of a binary tree. This is what we talked about on Monday. And so let's switch back to our notes here. So if I wanted to convert this tree here into array form, uh, this guy is going to be index 0 of the vector, index 1, index 2, 3. It's like we're writing, we're like reading a book, reading left to right, top to bottom. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. So if I draw out my vec over here, here's vec. The root is always index 0, and it holds the value of 10. And then the left child of it holds 11. The right child of it holds 20. And then this guy's left child holds 100 in slot 3. In slot 4, we have 50. In slot 5, we have 25. In slot 6, we have 1,000. And then uh, 200 here, 8, we got Sanbyaku, 100, 9, we got 51, 
and 10, we got 500. And in 11, we have 30. Now you might look at this and you're like, it's not sorted, right? It's not sorted smallest to greatest. And you're right, only the first element is actually sorted, right? Only the first element is the smallest element, right? After that, it's like, it's like, it's like kind of sorted, right? Like in general elements towards the top are gonna be smaller ones, but like you can have an a thousand here and like a 30 down here, you know what I mean? Like there's no, um, the, the, the heap invariant only applies to your kids, right? So this guy doesn't have any kids, uh, but if he did, they would have to be bigger than a thousand, but this guy's a different child. So like, so this guy could be 30 and that guy could be a thousand. So they're not sorted exactly. They're kind of sorted, right? The only, the only person that is guaranteed to be sorted is the minimum value here. And then when you pop it off, then you swap the 30 up here and you bubble it down. And after you've finished the bubbling process, then it's guaranteed the root is again, the smallest value. Does that make sense to you guys? And also, do you understand this conversion? Because these two things here are the same, right? The array representation and the tree representation are exactly the same data structure. It's just this one is gonna have pointers and this one's not, okay? Does heap have a sort function? You cannot sort a heap. You cannot sort a heap. All you can do is push, pop, top, and size. That's it. And so if you want to sort the heap, what you do is you push data into it, and you delete the heap by popping all the data out of it. And now the heap's dead. We did it, Patrick. We saved the city. You know, and, uh, <laughs> you got all the data sorted now, but the heap's dead, right? Like you deleted everything out of it. So uh, you can uh, sort a heap by just pushing data into it and then popping it all out, then it's all sorted and you can put that into a vector. And now you've got a, now you've got a sorted vector. That's literally what we just did here. You push everything into the heap, you pop everything off the heap, it's now sorted. But the heap itself is now um, dead after that. Okay. Uh, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, all right. So there you go. We did it, Patrick. We sorted the heap. All right. <laughs> There's no heap left, but it, it's sorted now. Okay, cool. All right, so we need to do push. We need to do a pop. We need to do a top. Oops, that's heap sort. Okay. Uh, we need to do top, and then we need size. Okay, so I'll let one of you guys write the size function. Git size, or just size, I guess. It should be called git size. So somebody give me a function that will properly return the size. The most proper way that you can think of because I, I know, I know, like getters are, you know, real tricky sometimes. Uh, although actually I'm gonna throw a curveball at you guys because we did talk about no discard, right? So make sure it's no discard, make sure it's a const method. I want you guys doing this as appropriately as possible. We don't want any inappropriate code in this class. This class is only the most appropriate of all codes. So uh, that is not quite right, um, Aaron, because here, let me put this up here, because there's a couple problems with this. Uh, first of all, it's an infinite loop. So your get function went from being order one to order infinite because get size is calling get size. It's never actually returning the size. It's just going to forever, forever loop. Um, the other problem with it is that you're returning a size underscore T, which is correct for, um, it's maybe even more correct than what I did here. I actually like using integers for size instead of size underscore t's. So I have a integer size, so you have to return an integer here. Okay. Um, and the reason why I do that is because if I ever difference two sizes, then um, if you use the size underscore t, which is an unsigned 64-bit integer on our system, uh, it'll underflip if one of them is smaller than the other. So in ints are actually just a lot easier to work with. Um, you know, size underscore T is probably more quote unquote correct because you can't have a negative size, right? So it should be an unsigned integer. Uh, but I've seen a lot of bugs just from people differencing sizes. Like, is this tree bigger than this tree? Three minus five should be negative two, right? Wrong, it's negative 4.2 billion. Oh no, sorry, it's even bigger than that. It's, it's a large number if you subtract three and five if they're unsigned integers because it'll underflow. So I actually, my, I, I, this isn't 
maybe great computer science, but I actually kind of like using integers uh, just because then you don't have to worry about differencing them. If, if you're in a, if you're in a area where every scrap of performance is important, then using a uh, size underscore T will um, allow you to avoid comparing with negatives, which is nice. There's performance benefits to it, um, but I could, I could go either way on it. Cons is good here. We, de we definitely do not want an infinite loop here. We want to just return size, and then uh, we want no discard here. No D DSI card, no discard. Yep. And no discard needs. Okay. So no discard, get size. And so if you call get size in main, like if we make our heap, we're going to make a heap of integers named Bob. And if we say see out Bob dot get size, this is cool. This is A-OK. -okay. But if we just call Bob dot get size by itself, that will warn. And it's going to warn because we gave it the no discard attribute. Okay. So, uh, yeah. And, and actually, oh, that's a good point. We actually don't need, we actually don't need size. We can just use the vector. Yeah. So in that case, we can do size underscore T and we're just going to return vector dot size. And, and then we might as well call our guy size also, because why not? So we'll do this. Or X, and there we go. So uh, we're just going to mimic the standard library here. So rather than get size, we're just calling it size uh, for better or worse. I'm not really sure if the uh, standard library's naming system for methods is particularly good. Vec.empty in particular is an issue. Vec.size sounds like you're sizing it. It should be get size, in my opinion. And vec.empty should be vec.is empty to return true or false if it's empty or not. But, you know. We'll, we'll just copy them. Okay, so now we are going to use a size underscore t because that's what vector dot size returns. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, return get size over and over again, the never ending black hole of size. And so if you don't do anything with the return value, then it warrants, which is nice. So we could do like int x equals pop size, and then it's, then it's happy. We're, ca we're capturing the return value. There's literally no reason to call the size function if you're not catching the return value or scouting it or something. So no discard, good times, highly recommend. Same thing for top, right? Top also should be marked as no discard, right? Because if you're if you're grabbing the top value of the heap and you don't do anything with it, what are you doing? What's, <laughs> you know, like you're, 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 you're probably doing something wrong. Like if you just call, if you just call like bob.top like that, you it's probably wrong, right? You, Probably want to be like putting into a variable or see outing it or something, right? Can you disable that? The warnings? I could just not put no discard there. Yeah. But you the the point of it, the point of it is to have the warning, you know what I mean? Like the, the point is if you are doing something wrong, you want a warning. Like you should you should be compiling your code with no warnings at all. The only warnings that are safe to ignore are um Unused variable and unused parameter. And I sometimes turn off sign comparisons too, because it kind of annoys me. Um, and so if you're not using a variable, yeah, if, if, if that's like your final version of the code, it's probably wrong. But like while you're doing development, like oftentimes it'll declare a bunch of variables. You just haven't gone around to using them yet. I'm just like, shush, shush. <laughs> I know, I will get to it. So if I have a function parameter that I haven't gone to writing yet, I don't want it warning me. And so I, I, I'm, I'm pretty good about not having unused variables anyway. So I really don't need the help with it. Um, so sitter, getters should, yeah, getters should always be no discard. And they should always be const methods too. Um, just as general, pra like, I, I can't, I can't imagine why you would call a get function that's not no discard. You know what I mean? Like, wh why are you doing this? It doesn't, like, it's probably wrong. Like, if you do this code here, this code here is probably wrong. Like, this is probably not what the programmer meant. But if you do this, you know, and you're actually using the return value. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, no discard means no discard means you can't drop the return value, right? Like here, the return value is being returned back to main, and we're not catching it. It's like you're throwing a football to somebody, and they just like let the ball drop. 
Like, sometimes that's okay. Like, if you have a function that, uh, you know, just tells you if the insert was successful or not, sometimes you don't care. But when there's zero purpose to calling size or top, uh, yeah, you should tag it as no discard. Okay. Uh, you have to use it or else warning. Yeah. And, and yeah, you can, like, supposedly, like, you can, like, cast it to a void to, like, get it to shut up. You know, if you're like, I know, I know, just work with me here. You can, you can shut up the warning using uh, a void cast like that. What about pop? Pop is not no discard. You can't have no discard on a void function. I, I don't even think that would make any sense at all because um, it, it's not returning a value. No discard means you must pay attention to my return value. I put all this time and effort into making this return value for you. Here it is, and they and the just like drop it on the floor, right? Like right here, it's returning a value to main, and then main does nothing with it. Here's your here's your birthday cake. Oh, cool. Drop, right? But pop, like, like what does it even mean to be no discard? Like it, it's not returning anything. No discard means the return value has to be captured, has to be caught by the person calling the function. And pop doesn't return anything, so it, no discard doesn't make any sense with it. You just call pop. Okay. So, um, yeah. Ain't gonna cook food and no one's gonna eat it. Uh, yeah. I don't want to play with you anymore. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so, all right, let's do this. So we got two of our functions done. We need push and pop. All right, so push. Um, all right, so what we're gonna do is come back over to our conceptual map here. So if we're gonna add a new person to here, let's say we push, ah, okay. <laughs> one note, not good. Uh, give me a number to insert. And we will, uh, we will insert that one conceptually, 42 and 69, okay. Uh, we'll do 42. So uh, we insert it here. So what slot into the into the array is this going to go into? It's going to go right here. The end. Yeah. Do you guys know any functions to add a new element to the end of a vector? Pushback. Yeah, it's really easy. Okay, so to start off with, uh, we just uh, come up here. Uh, so we just are going to call pushback, right? So we're just going to add it to here. And then we're going to have to do the bubbling up. But yeah, okay. So we're going to call push. And so we're just going to say vector.pushback, new data, like that. Add the new guy to the end of the tree thingy, array, tree, what? Conceptually, it's a tree, but in practice, it's actually an array. OK, now we need to check while, mm, OK, so int index equals back dot size. So if there's 12 people in the tree already, we're going to slot 12. 1, 2, 3, right, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So we go into slot 12. So this is our this is our index. We're in index 12 in the tree. And what we need to do is check to see if we are bigger or smaller than our parent. So uh, we need a function uh, that will return at index. And we need left child and right child. Okay, so if we are at index 12, how do we get the index of our parent? Push front, <laughs> no. Uh, so how do we get the index of our parent? Do you guys remember the algebra for that? So to figure out the index of a child, it's you double it and you add one for the left kid, you double it and add two for the right kid. So if you double four, you get eight, plus one is nine, double four is eight, plus two is 10. How do you 
get the parents index. So for at 10, how do we get the index of four? That is correct. You subtract one and divide by two, uh, rounding down. But yeah, it's integer division, so it always rounds down, which is nice. So yeah, 10 minus one is nine, nine divided by two is four, because we're an integer rule. Uh, 10 minus one is nine, nine divided by two is five. No, that's an 11, that's not a 10. Okay, 11, that makes a little more sense. Okay, 11 minus one is 10. I can read my own handwriting, I promise. Uh, 11 minus one is 10, 10, 10 divided by two is five. 12 minus one is 11, 11 divided by two is five. So that is the formula. So we're gonna return index minus one divided by two. And then the formula for the children is index times two plus one and index times two plus two. That's how you get the, and, and this is really nice because you don't have to worry about pointers. Like you can just find out who your parent is. You can find out who your kids are just by using your index in the array. It's really cool. So if we're, if we're at index 12 right now, our parent is going to be 12 divided by two is 11 divided by uh, 12 minus one is 11 divided by two is five. So our parent is going to be 25. So we're 42 and we need to compare ourselves with 25. Now, uh, birth certificate, I need to find my parents. Ouch. Okay. So, uh, how do we, are, are we doing a min heap or are we doing a max heap? I, I, I suppose we should have, <laughs> maybe, maybe we make this a Boolean. Maybe we make this a Boolean. Yeah, let's do this. All right. Uh, bool min is min heap. We can make it go both ways. All right. Uh, is min heap is false. Uh, new is min heap. Min heap. New is min heap. Okay. So maybe we can have it work. Now, is, is this going to be, is, it's going to be too complicated. Let's just pick one. Let's just keep it simple. Let's just keep it simple. Okay. Let's just say it's a, let's just say it's a min heap. Max heap. Okay, we can do max heap. All right. Now let's do min heap because earlier in the earlier in the class earlier in the class we we're doing min heaps and so I've already got a min heap drawn. I don't want to change it. So we're doing a min heap. All right. The standard library does a max heap. By the way, the the default for the priority queue is a max heap. So highest priority people uh, get into the club first, just like in real life. Okay. So we've just uh, inserted our thing here. Now we need to do a while loop. So we have to say while the index is greater than zero, because right, if we push at the root, we're done, right? Like, like, like if we push and we're the root, we're good, right? Or if we ever bubble up to the top and we're now at index zero, we're done, right? So while, while we're uh, down in the heap somewhere, we need to compare our value with the value of our parent. So our value is just this. They just inserted 42, so new data is 42. And our parent's value, parent value, I don't know, is equal to vector dot at parent of index. So the parent function, so if we're at index 12, the parent function says your parent's at five. And so it's gonna grab the value of five out of there. And so parent val is going to be, in our example over here, 25. So we're going to compare 42 and 25. So if our value, which is new data, if our value is greater than parent value, or equal, I guess, we're done. This is the essence of a heap right here, okay? You check, you get the value of your parent and then you check to see if you have broken the heap property. Now we're doing a min, uh, we're doing a min heap, right? So if our value is bigger than the parent's value because you guys chose 42, we're done, right? We don't have to bubble up, right? You guys understand? Like, right, we're done. Push, good. Make sense? Okay. So uh, what if uh, what if though we need to swap? What if what if we've broken the the heap invariant? 
then we need to swap our value and our parent's value, right? So we need to swap uh, vec dot at index with vec dot at parent. Okay. So if we had inserted, let's say, two instead of forty-two. That now the heap property has not been satisfied. So we have to switch our value and the value of our parent. So the parent's gonna be now be two and our value is gonna be twenty-five. Do you guys understand this? So swap switches the values of two variables. So we are at index index and our parents are at you know, we're at twelve, our parents are at five. So it switches the value in vector dot at five and vector at twelve, it switches their value. And now we are at our parents index and we repeat. So uh, we were at 12 before, but we just switched to and 25. And 25. So we are currently at index five now. And then we repeat, we switch 20 and two. And now, no, too much. So after we switch 20 and that's convenient, 20 and two, now our index is two, right? Our index is two now. And now we compare two and its parent and it's gonna switch 10 and two. And now our index is zero, our index is zero. And so we're done. So this is a perfectly acceptable push function for a heap. And the last thing we need to do is pop. Uh, before we do this, let's test it maybe a little bit. Um, since we're writing our own uh, heap, we could actually uh, cheat a little bit and have a print function. So we can say void print and just uh, say for every um, const t reference in the vector, see out. See, there we go. See how it t with the end line like that. And so this is something we can do bob.print that normal priority queues cannot. You can't actually print out a priority queue in the standard library, but uh, we are making our own class here. And so we can do what we want and ain't nobody gonna tell me I can't print out my own data structure. So uh, let's do some pushes in here. So we're gonna push um, I can, okay, yeah. Let's, Get this cleaned up a little bit because uh, the array is now out of sync. So two has been swapped with 20. And then 10 swaps with two. Okay. So let's just push some of these numbers into it. I don't want to do all of them. Two, two, 11, 10, 150. Okay. Two. Hundred, eleven, fifty, uh, okay. So before I move on to pop, I want to test my code because uh, I've actually not written a heap on my own, I don't know, in a while. So let's test it. Like whenever you do development, you always want to test your code and make sure that it is working properly. Will this code be posted in public? Yes, it will. Okay. So uh, after we push 100, we push 100, we print. We push 11, we print. Push 2 and print. Push 50, print. So we can actually see if this code is working correctly. So we push 100, good. And we push 11, you can see 11 bubbled up to the front. We then push two. And so two is gonna come in and slot two, and then it's gonna swap with a root. And so the previous root was 11. So you can see the, the 11 moved down into slot two because that's where two came in. And then we put 50 in 
50 is the child of 100, so 50 and 100 swap, and then 50 does not swap with 2. So yeah, our push function, A-OK. -okay. All right. Um, let, me, let me check in with you guys here. Conceptually, do heaps make sense to you? Like how kind of things are supposed to be? Push, pop, top. Uh, like, does it make sense? Like, what we use them for? Like, when you want to get the minimum value a lot, like they're pretty good at that, and they're also good at like uh, being compact. Like, they're full and complete. You don't have any, you don't have any um, gaps in the tree. That's really nice. It's contiguous in memory, which makes it fast. Um, okay, so now we're gonna get to the hard part. So this is delete, also AKA pop. All right, I love it when you call me Big Papa. All right, so might be too old for you guys, I don't know. All right, uh, so what we're gonna do with Pop is, uh, Biggie, thank you, thank you. All right, um, <laughs> you never know like when people are gonna get your references. You know, I was like, I, I remember being in one class and I was like, hey, uh, it's like that scene in Star Wars and somebody's like, uh, what's Star Wars? I'm like, How many people here have not seen Star Wars? Like half the class put up their hand. Holy smokes. All right. Um, not heard of it? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes, man, I feel old. All right. So, uh, you, you've never heard of Star Wars, Sam, or you just haven't seen Star Wars? Because there's kind of a difference between the two of them, right? You've only heard about it before in Legends. <laughs> and sorry if you can hear the gardeners outside. They're working on our front lawn right now you've never seen star wars okay but have you heard of it like have you like because like last class we were talking about like the you know like the spaceship operator you know which looks like a tie fighter i haven't seen star wars until my game design teacher and his first ever to watch it are you talking about me did i i didn't make people watch or are you talking about a different game design class you know yoda the green guy okay yeah, yeah. all right so you know what a TIE fighter is. Okay, cool. Right. High school game development. Okay, cool. All right. Anyway, so pop. So what we're going to do with pop is uh, we are going to swap the... We're going to swap 2 and 25. So this guy and this guy are going to swap. So uh, that will become 2. That will become 25. And then we are going to... This becomes uh, 2. This one becomes 25. Uh, then, do you guys know a way of erasing the last element of a vector? Because what we're going to do is we are going to delete this node from existence and just make it like that. So you guys know a function in the vector class that erases the last element from it. Yeah, pop back. So what we're going to do is start off by saying swap. Uh, hmm, interesting question. What if we call pop on an empty uh, priority queue? What should we do? So if size equals zero, what do we do? Die, die, die. Uh, throw, run timer, something like that. You can't pop off an empty heap. Come on, guy. Take your head out of your ears. So, problem handled. You done goofed, a eh, eh, Ron. All right, uh, so that'll handle the, the case where there is nothing there. Uh, and then we're gonna swap uh, the root. Root is index zero, right? The root is always at index zero, easy. So we're gonna swap uh, vector dot at zero with vector dot at whoever the last guy is. Um, it's vector dot size minus one vector dot size minus one is the last guy or we could do vector dot back which would also work do you guys know about that? there's vector dot back that's the last guy and a vector um, is pointer heap based better than array based? no there's zero reason to use a pointer based heap uh, the array representation 
has a huge massive downside when you have an unbalanced tree because the uh if you have a tree that grows unbalanced your memory usage becomes exponential you get you have an order two to the n memory usage to hold essentially a linked list which is really really bad it's it's terribly bad it's horribly bad but a heap is guaranteed to always not have any holes in it so array based is the only way that anybody with uh, any sense would implement a heap. So, so yeah, we're gonna switch the top and the bottom and then we're gonna just call pop back. So we switched the first element and the last element and then we can say vector dot pop back and uh, this will erase the, um, the root essentially from existence. Now the root's still there, there's still somebody in slot zero and we're gonna have to bubble down in a second, but I wanna just verify this. So after I've got all this stuff here, I'm gonna test my code. Remember, one of the rules of software development is incremental development. Write a couple lines of code and then test. Now you might, you might be like, well, we didn't test these things. And I'm like, yeah, it's because like, I'm good enough to know how to write a getter without, you know what I mean? Like, it's pretty trivial. I'm not gonna screw that part up. Hopefully, <laughs> but like for something like this, we're swapping things around. You can have off by one errors, you know, like it's very common for people to like forget the negative one there, or you could just use vector.back, which is why that exists. Um, so we're gonna test it. Okay, we wrote we wrote two lines of code, right? Plus a, a exception. So, uh, okay, so what happened here is we swapped two and 100 and then pop back and two went away. And so you can see that 100 is now up in the root. Okay. But if I'm feeling optimistic and do it all in one. Yeah, that's that's what like Bill Griswold at UCSD was studying. And basically if you write it all at once and then try debugging it, you're gonna have 30 different errors in your code and you're gonna flounder. And so he, he and his uh, doctoral student were studying struggle, like why students struggle and how long they struggle for. If you write all of your code at once, it is a recipe for struggle. Okay, so that worked. Um, we should probably test the, the throw, right? So uh, let's try this, bob.pop. And this should, we're popping off an empty, we're popping off an empty heap. Boom. Uh, what happened? You can't pop off an empty heap. Come on, some on guy. Okay, that's a typo. Uh, come on guy, take your head out of your ears. Okay, so it's literally, a, this is why you test it. This is why like even, Something trivial, right? You have got a typo there, right? So that one's good. And then let's call top. So we call top. And if we call top on an empty vector, it says, oh, out of range, throws an exception, kills you. Cool. Now the the standard library, the standard library priority queue does not check for being empty. It will 100% seg fault. So if you top, uh, or pop off of an empty priority queue, um, it will, well, it's not guaranteed to seg vault because who knows, it's, unde it's, uh, it's undefined behavior. But basically in practice, if you try grabbing the top element of a priority queue, uh, when there's nothing in the priority queue, it will probably seg vault, which to me is just like, not great design. Now, the, the people who make the standard library have to assume they have a constraint where they don't want to be slow, right? Like they don't want to write code that's pointless, that slows the code down. And so in a normal loop, what you do is you say, if there's stuff remaining in the priority queue, delete from the priority queue. And there are, and so the user is probably going to be doing that if statement anyway. But I personally do not like writing code that can seg fault. Like I don't. Um, this by the way here is not a seg fault. When you go out of bounds there, it throws an exception, which is an okay way of dying. And this code here, it throws an exception. And so main could like catch it, you know, and be like, oh, I screwed up, you know, or something like that. But uh, um, I don't, I, it's just like a personal thing that I write. It's like, I'm willing to take the, you know, 0.01% overhead cost of an if statement and just make sure my code doesn't crash. It's just a personal thing that I have. Um, yeah, so the standard library um, doesn't do these bounce checking. Okay, 
Uh, so we did our swap. Now we need to bubble down. Okay. So again, we're going to say while. Just do while true, I guess. So I guess if we're. I guess if we're in the bottom row, we can stop. But whatever. Okay. So uh, if, uh, okay, what is our index? Okay, so our index. Let's see, swap this up. Okay, so we're going to start off with our index, and index equals zero. Okay, so if our index, so if we're in the bottom row, we're done. Or if we don't have any kids. So there's a couple of different ways you can you can do this, um, right? Like if we, if we got here, right, we're done because there's nobody below us. We don't have to check. So basically, if, if we don't have any kids, we're done. If we do have kids, we have to check both of our kids and see if we're. Um, so we can have zero kids, in which case we're done. We can have one kid, in which we just have to check with our one kid and repeat. Uh, or we could have two kids, in which case you have to find the smaller of the two kids and swap with them. So I'll just. I'll just special case out each one of those things. Okay, so zero kids means done. One kid means swap with kid if they're smaller than us. And two kids means swap with the smallest kid if they're smaller than us. Okay. Okay, so uh, zero kids. Okay, so uh, and left index equals left child of index, right index. Okay, so we're gonna get the index of our left child, the index of our right child. So if we're at root right now, the left child's gonna be one, the right child's gonna be two. If we're here, your left child is three, your right child is four. Okay. So we're gonna grab, we're gonna grab the index of our two kids. And if any of those index if any of those indices are out of bounds, right? So here if we have vector dot size of 12, if any of the indices are like 12 or above, then they're out of bounds and they don't count. Okay. So uh, so if the left kid is out of bounds, the right kid is definitely gonna be, so we only have to check for that one. Okay. So if left uh, Do you guys see that? Like if the left kid is out of bounds, then the right kid has to be because they're to the right of, you know what I mean? Like if the left kid is 12, the right kid's gonna be at 13. So they're gonna be out of bounds too. So we only have to check for the left kid for this, okay. So if left index is greater than or equal to vector dot size, then break, we're done. That makes sense? So like if we were here, if we're at index six, we get the index of our left kid and our right kid. The left kid's index is 13. The right kid's index is 14. 13 is bigger than the size of the vector, which is 12. So if we were here and we're bubbling down, we're done because there's nobody below us to, to swap with. You guys understand that? Okay. So then with one kid, and this is the case that a lot of people forget about, right? Because um, almost every almost every person in the tree that has a kid has two kids, right? But there is a possibility you have one kid if you're here, right? So if your right kid is exactly at 12, right? In this case, the size of the vector is 12. If your right kid is 12, that means you have exactly one child. So if right index double equals vector dot size, then we are in the one kid situation. Otherwise, we're in the two kid situation. All right, so if we have one kid, uh, what do we need to check? It's like, let's say we're bubbling down, we're bubbling down, we're bubbling down, and we're here. What do we need to check with our, with our left kid? And we're only gonna have a left kid. We can't have a right kid and no left kid. It's, then there would be a hole. So what do we have to check between the two of them? My cursor isn't showing. Okay, well, whatever. Um, just compare them. Okay. Uh, here, if we're at twenty, what do we have to what What do we have to check? 
which value do we have to check against 20? Yeah, left index, right? So, so if our value, um, so if our value, our value is vector dot at index. If our value is, we're doing a min heap. So if we are bigger than the value of our left kid, then we do a swap. So we're going to swap vector dot at index vector dot at left index, and then index equals left index, and so uh, then we we go from us being at five to us being at eleven, and we repeat. So as we go down, our index changes because we're like, like let's say we we deleted, we put a we deleted, we put like a a hundred up here or something, you know after we switch values, then we're now at two. And then we repeat. And so that's handling the one kid case. Now we got the two kid case. This is the hardest case. So um, if, and if we're, uh, if otherwise we're done. So we break out of the loop. If we are, if we are smaller than our, our child, we're done, and we can just stop. Okay. Now with the two kid case, we know that both of them are there, so we can actually just uh, grab the values. I don't need to draw this. Okay. So we'll just get the values. So I've got my value is equal to vector dot at index, and then we got the left value, which is value dot at left index. We got the right value. The right index, and we know none of these are going to seg fault, so I could be using square brackets. You might notice I'm using dot at for everything as just an extra safety check. Um, if I ever need speed, if I ever have the need, the need for speed, then I can come back and actually replace pretty much all of these dot ats with square brackets to make it go faster. But uh, for me, when doing development, maximum safety when doing development because you want to know immediately if you go out of bounds if you screw something up. And it's entirely possible, right? It's entirely possible. I'm actually not testing this code nearly as much as I should be just because I'm trying to get it done uh, in time. So we never use pointers in a heap. Yep, it's all just indices. Like, you know, my left child is at slot 11, my right child's at slot 12, you know, and you just, you know, just grab the values out of them. Now we're gonna see who's smallest. So if if we're smaller than both of our kids, we're done. So if uh, if I am smaller than my left kid, and I am smaller than my right kid, we're done. Right? Like if I'm 11, I'm smaller than 100, I'm smaller than 50, we're done. Otherwise, we have to figure out which one of the two kids is smallest. All right? So if left val is less than right val, then the left kid is smallest. Bubble down to the left. Otherwise, bubble down to the right. So uh, we are going to swope vector dot at index, vector dot at left index. So if the left child is a smaller one, we're going to switch our value with the left child and then index is equal to left index. And if the right child is the smallest, then we will switch for S, right? And that, my friends, I think is a working heap implementation, but fingers crossed, let's test it. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're calling pop here. Um, uh, let's throw some more data in here, uh, 60 and 500 and 
negative 23. All right, we're gonna print it. We're gonna pop. We're gonna call pop, and we're gonna print it again. And let's see if we seg fault. No, no seg fault. Okay, cool. So negative 23 is in fact the minimum value. When we pop it, we're gonna switch 11 and negative 23, and then 11 is gonna be smaller than 50. That's its left kid. And its right kid is two. So two is smaller than 11. So two is gonna swap into the roots, that worked. And then 11 is gonna be here. Its left kids are, uh, let's see, zero, zero, one, two, two times two plus one is five, two, three, four, five. So 500 and uh, that's it. So it had one kid and 11 is, 11 is smaller than 500. So yeah. It worked first time. How about that? I say that and there's probably, let's, let's throw some more data in here just to, just to make it. Now, what about duplicates? Um, I would actually allow duplicates, right? Because like, if you have a grenade going off at time 10, you can have multiple grenades going off on time 10. Like that's fine. Like I don't, I don't have any particular problems with that. You know, and it's not going to be 500. Let's do all right so 23 was the smallest value we switch 4200 and 23 and then we look at five and two as our two kids so 4200 has two kids after we you guys understand like we, when we did the pop, we started off with negative 23 as the root. So when we pop it, we switched negative 23 and the last element in the heap, which is 4,200. So 4,200 comes up to the top, negative 23 goes to the back and we call pop back and go bye bye And negative 23 is nowhere to be seen anywhere anymore. And then we have 4,200 as the root and it's got two kids, five and two. So which value is smaller between five and two? So the left kid is five, the right kid is two. Which way do we bubble down? 4,200 is the root. Which way do we bubble down? Double down to the right. And so you'll see, in fact, that two is now the root. And then we have 4,200 here. And I don't want to draw the entire tree. I'm just going to do this mathematically. So this is index two, two times two. Four plus one is five. So we've got 500 as the left child and 11 as the right child of 4,200. So the 11 is going to swap in for here. There it is. And uh, the 500 is still there. So you can see 4,200 is now there. And there are no children of 4,200. And that's where it ended up. And the rest of the tree is left untouched. Okay. So that is... Uh, that is... That is a thing. Uh, if we wanted to, we can sort all these values by, uh, in fact, this will be a good way of testing to see if the code works right. You know what I mean? So uh, let's just get rid of these prints here so we don't spam ourselves. I'm just gonna toss a in fact, in fact, check this out. I still got all this code, right? Mm -hmm. Neat. Uh, so let's just kick it back old school, maybe. Mm. Or I can just use these four lines because I kind of want I, I kind of want to keep this testing data for a second. So while uh, yeah, okay, two uh, uh, s Bob and the real. So you can see all the numbers come out, came out sorted. So we made our own heap, and the heap is sorting all this data. And then I can, now that I'm happy that that test case worked, then I will switch in this code here. In fact, in fact, let me just do this. Let me just do this. No, no code graveyard anymore. Instead of a priority queue events, we have a heap events. And our, our, our class we just made in class today should be uh, drop in replaceable for 
the priority Q class. So if I type in 50 and 60 and negative 10, 100 and 9,000, 78, 90, and this, then comes out sorted. How about that? You guys like it? That is that is everything there is to say about heaps, at least as far as implementation goes. There's only the four functions. We added a print that doesn't belong, but it's very useful, very useful for uh, debugging to be able to print your data structure. Uh, that seems niche. Um, all of the data structures uh, kind of have their own niches. The heap niche isn't necessarily that big. But yeah, anytime you're going to be repeat, repeatedly getting the minimum value of the heap is the, or the maximum value of something, the heap's the, the way to go. Um, it's uh, very compact. It can be held contiguously just in a vector. And so it's fast because it's contiguous in memory. It's uh, order log and insert, order log and delete, which is pretty fast. Uh, top is always order one, size is order one. So it's a, it's a pretty good, you know, if, 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 if you need a lot of mins, it's, it's your go-to kind of thing. So uh, if that was a lot of information, good news, everyone. Your Zybooks over spring break is going to be on heaps. Now, I'm giving you guys till Wednesday, because I assume a lot of you will be using the last chance over spring break. For a quick reminder, there is a special spring break amnesty program where if you uh, complete an entire chapter of the CSI 40 Zybooks, first semester of Zybooks, you can make up one of your missing homework assignments. You have to do all of it, though, and you have to do it without cheating, without copying and pasting answers from the interwebs. And uh, for each entire chapter of Zybooks you do, which will take a long time, don't wait until the last minute. Don't. It's a really bad idea, because the Zybooks actually take a long time to go through. Uh, then you're given the ability to actually do the homework assignment you're missing points on. So this is your last chance, quite literally, to bring your grade up from an F into passing territory. Okay. There's no tutor stuff with these last chances. It is entirely on uh, you just doing the Zybooks and messaging me when you get it done. No no tutors are open over spring break. Okay, So if you're going to... Zybooks take four hours minimum each chapter. Yeah, so don't... Like, don't be like, I'll start this at Sunday, you know. You might get, like, one chapter done, you know, and you can make up one homework because you still got to do the homework. So, uh, but, yeah, your upcoming Zybooks is on heaps, and so um, this here is fully functional heap code. Uh, let me toss this copy main.cc into public heap, 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 harambe, no, heap.cc. So if you want the code for today, you can admire it, appraise it, frame it, print it, it and uh, uh, frame it, put it up on your wall, look at it every day, and admire the beauty of the heap. Become one with the heap. Join the heap. <laughs> and enjoy your spring break otherwise. I'll see you guys.